with your host, Nick Day, of JGA Recruitment, Specialist Payroll Recruiters. Hello and welcome. I am delighted today to be joined by Stuart Hall. For those in the payroll industry who are not yet familiar with Stuart, he is an experienced company director with over 40 years experience within the payroll and HR sectors. He has successfully started not one, not two, but three companies from scratch and has been able to build each one into very profitable businesses as well. More recently, Stuart has launched a new payroll software business called payrun.io, which is based on API technology. I will find out more about that later. And he has also recently become non-executive director at the Chartered Institute of Payroll Professionals. Stuart's approach has always been to aim for excellence and with wide ranging skills in managed payroll processing, hosting services, bureau services, HR, self-service, e-payslips and SaaS. I am absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to pick his brains today on the Payroll Podcast. So Stuart, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to have you on board. Five quick questions. So Stuart, you started working in payroll in 1980. I have to confess it's a year before I was even born, which hopefully gives the listeners God. a bit of an indication just to how experienced you are in the industry. But during this time, you've obviously witnessed significant change. I'd be really keen to find out a little bit more about how you've seen the industry change over that time, how it's influenced your career and perhaps some of the decisions or career progressive steps that you took during that time to, to get to where you are now. Well, as you say, Nick, uh, yeah, things have changed significantly yeah. since the, the 1980s. In fact, my very, very first payroll role was working as a payroll clerk in a company called Ferry Aviation. Um, and they had a little office uh, not far from Heathrow Airport. And I worked in the payroll department there with uh, a young lady who taught me everything she knew about payroll. And at that time, payroll was really just filling in pieces of uh, information on forms that were then collected once a week, taken off to ADP. And then back from ADP came these reports and payslips. Really, at that time, I had no idea how to calculate a payroll, but really just knew about collecting all the data. But I learned an awful lot about making sure that the right money was put in the right brown envelope. <laughs> because when you stand at that little window and you hand out the brown envelopes each week and those guys open those envelopes, they know exactly what they're going to get paid. So the last thing you wanted to do as well was pack up all those envelopes and find you've got some money left over at the end, because that meant you had to go all the way through and find out where the mistake was. Sure. So from those early days and in that side of things, I, I guess really I, I've always been somebody that's wanted to always go the one step more, be better, improve and develop. Even in my early days in ADP, started off as an implementer. I worked on the helpline. I've managed to get that job purely because I was a, already an ADP client down the road. So moving into ADP and doing those things and then moving into a sales role, that all helped me in terms of my progression into not only learning the industry, learning payroll, and also learning how to, to work with people as well. That was a great start. And of course, goodness knows what happened to all those uh, manual payslips or anything <laughs> else we had to deal with in those times, but a great start into the industry. So how did you then make that step from... ADP, obviously went through different divisions, different areas of the business, always increasing your knowledge on payroll to becoming your own director of your own business, founding something for yourself. Okay. I think uh, we won't dwell, dwell on this bit too long, but really I was in my 11th year at ADP. I was very successful. And as far as I was concerned, I wanted to be the next MD of ADP. Sure. Uh, I was working towards that position and saying, I, I could do the MD role, I could do the financial director's role, I could do the production director's <laughs> role. People used to say, if you were going to chop my arm off at that point, you would have seen ADP written through it, it was like a stick of rock. Sadly, in the January of 1991, my seven-year-old son died. He was a patient at Great Street Hospital, not been very well from birth, he had a heart defect. But as you can imagine, when you lose a seven-year-old son, it's devastating. Sure. So really, I found it difficult to work for anybody, never mind ADP. And really felt that I couldn't motivate myself. I couldn't even motivate a sales team. So I left the company, spent a few months doing nothing, but then realized I didn't need some money. And so it was my father-in-law who actually one day sat down with me and said, Stuart, why don't you just do it yourself? You know how to implement, you know how to sell, you know how to run payrolls. All you've got to do is learn how to do the accounting bit and you've got your own business. And it took me a few days to think about it. And I decided, yep, yeah, in for a penny, in for a pound and started off a company called Tax Filing Services. It grew a little bit over the first year, 
and significantly grew over the next two or three years to the point where five years later, I had over 90 clients and was running payrolls for a lot of small payrolls, but very, very happy with it. And so really, I guess I was thrown in the deep end into payroll into kind of running my sure. own business. Sure. But realized at the end of five years that if I wanted to go further, I was going to have to make a lot of changes and felt that I needed to go and learn more about business. So put the company up for sale and uh, found a buyer and then moved track, joined what was then the old data sciences, yeah. um, who then became IBM yeah. and spent a year with them. And it was just right. The focus that I needed in terms of going back into the corporate world. And you've been bitten by the entrepreneurial bug at that point. I certainly have, because I only spent uh, a year with IBM, and uh, I then got headhunted by the Bank of Scotland, who were also looking for payroll expertise in the London area. So there are plenty of it in Scotland, but nothing down in the London area. And uh, they asked me if I would head up the sales team and the implementation team. So I started off on my own and ended up with a team of four or five guys. The only thing there was after two or three years of that, I realized I was going to somebody else's business. Interesting. Okay. So decided it, the time was right to build my own business again. And that's effectively how Employer Services started. Fantastic. That resonates well with me as well. I think I had a, a similar situation, really. You just realized you could do this for yourself. In your view, how you could improve things or doing things in your own way or your own vision. And you, uh, mm. it's, it's that taking that step to doing it is the hardest transition. But you've got to back yourself, right? It's a big gamble when you've got a family and a home Absolutely. and a mortgage. Uh, again, I don't want to uh, dwell too much on the, on the loss of my son, but you know, when you've gone through a situation like that and you've lost somebody that's so dear to you, at the end of the day, you kind of sit back and go, nothing else can be worse than that. Sure. So let's just go out there and start a business. Fantastic. I've already mentioned before three very, very successful companies. One more, which we're going to find out a little bit more about later, <laughs> which I'm keen to. I know you're keen to talk about, but I certainly am as well. Something um, the listeners won't be aware of is we had lunch recently, Stuart, and you mentioned that one thing you – would like more from the industry or people could do more for themselves than working in payroll. And something that you did right from day dot is every month you ran a payroll, you would say, right, how could I do that payroll better? How could I improve on that payroll? How could I improve the processes involved in what I did this month, next month, and the same again next month? And I know that you've, you and I probably both find it a frustration sometimes that not every payroll person believes, believes they can make those changes or always believes they can improve things. So If you're a pearl person listening to this right now, what kind of advice would you give to those individuals who perhaps feel they could improve something but don't know how to raise the voice or how to implement Mm. the change? Let me give you a quick example. I remember a client sending me an overtime file. I posted the data in, I imported the the information into the payroll, sent the reports back to the client to the check, and the client came back and said, no, there was something not quite right. We weren't too sure it was not right, but there was something not quite right. The end result was that they'd sent me the overtime file from the previous week. Right. So immediately, I'm sitting down there at the end of that month saying, well, okay, I can't have that happen again. So what can I do to make sure that the file I received this month is correct or the file I approved for this pay period is correct? And and that's just a very quick example. So it's kind of, what do I do? Do I have to build something into the software? Is there something I can build into Microsoft Excel? Do I run a macro? Is it just a simple case of just picking up some information from the document and checking it against a document from the previous month. Didn't want to make more work for myself. Sure. But at the same time, I wanted to know how I could improve on that. And interestingly, you've just suggested five potential solutions. Correct. So for me, it was always a case of don't just sit there and say, it can't be done. Imagine that it can be done. And it's your role is just to go and find out what that solution is. Sure. The beauty is if people do take that ownership of a problem, it adds more strings to their boats because they're able to have more projects to their CVs that may involve you know, getting involved in projects or implementation situations which they never would have had access to. Yeah, that's true. And I think another example I could give would be when I was working on the helpline uh, within ADP. So part of my role there was as an implementer, I go out and I train the clients how to use the ADP system. And then on days when I'm not doing that, I'm sitting on the help desk. Sure. And what would infuriate me would be a client that would ring in and say, excuse me, but how do I do this? And I'm thinking, that's the client that I trained just two weeks ago. So why is it they have not understood what I said? So I would then go back and look at the documentation and say, okay, they didn't understand what I was training them on. So was it I didn't explain it too well? Yeah. Is it the documentation is not right? Were they not really in the room when I was kind of explaining that? And so it meant that when I did the next training course, I made sure I emphasized different bits that I knew that this would help the client and also 
it would save me taking too many calls on the help desk. Absolutely right. And actually what you've added there to your armory is the ability to improve processes or write new documentation, which is great. So as of now, January, two, well, as of this year, January 2018, you became non-executive director at the Charles Institute of Payroll Professionals. For those unfamiliar, also known as the CIPP. What does this involve and what value are you hoping to add? Well, uh, the evolved bit is the easy bit. Uh, so as part of my role, I, I attend uh, the board meetings yep. by the CIPP in their head office in Solihull. But, you know, you don't just turn up to a meeting and then just kind of listen and take part. There's a lot of work involved beforehand because all the documentation and the papers, it's, it's always best you read and understand what's actually going to be discussed. But also from the previous board meeting, making sure that any action points have actually been taken care of. Sure. I'd like to feel that the value that I can add to the meetings is obviously my experience in payroll, but not just in payroll in terms of running payrolls, but in running payroll bureaus and also the, the business uh, side of things from there as well. So at the moment, I'm very much in a learning situation, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. It's really good for me to get back into the payroll arena, if you like, but also I realise that I have got on the top on my shoulders the responsibility of all the members. Yeah. And being a member myself, I'm representing the members. And I think there's probably a lot of members need to kind of realise that as well, that you know, the CIPP is a group that is owned and run by members. One of the things that I've come to realise, being a member of the Institute as well, is that my responsibility on the board is to act on behalf of the membership. So whenever a decision has to be made, I try and put myself in the shoes of the member and say, Okay, what would our membership want? I get the sense that you uh, you like having that level of responsibility on your shoulders as well, Stuart. It's the businessman in you again. It's, uh, oh, it it always so. comes <laughs> out. You can't suppress it. So, look, if I'm an experienced power manager right now, perhaps I've been working in industry for a number of years, maybe at a bureau, maybe uh, it's an in-house payroll solution, and actually I have to decide for maybe work-life balance or whatever the reason might be that I want to go and do this for myself. Obviously, when you set up your own business, you, you learn from your mistakes as well. So are you able to enlighten us on perhaps some of the mistakes that you may have made or, the, or maybe put it a better way, some of the lessons that you learned that would help someone who perhaps wanted to take that risk, that gamble, if you like, to go and launch their own payroll business or payroll service or go self-employed? What advice would you give to someone in those shoes? Obviously, different people will want to start a payroll bureau or start their own business for, for many different reasons. With payroll... I think the first thing is that if you've already got somebody who's willing to be your first client, that's a really good start because I've been aware of people that start off a payroll bureau and they've had no clients for the first three or four months. Sure. Now, obviously, that can have a financial strain. So I think the first thing is, for me, it would be, are you aware of somebody who can be your first client or are you aware of how you're going to go out and get your first clients? The second thing would be making sure that you've got some software that you're comfortable with that is going to be suitable for your environment. So for example, if you're going to go and look for small clients, then you don't need a very big, large sure. product. But obviously, if you're going to start selling to big corporate companies, you're going to need a product that's actually going to match their requirements. For me, personally, it's actually having somebody at home who is going to support you. Starting off a new business can be very time consuming, it can put a strain on your relationships. I've had gone through a similar journey, so I can understand that. And you definitely need the support of your family or your friends around you. You certainly be successful. Do. It's really important. What do you think, though, in, in your particular case, has been the core component that you have that's allowed you to be successful in all of your businesses? I mean, I, I can tell already you're very solutions driven. But what do you think is the core component, if you had to sum it up, that's allowed you to be as successful as you have been? The main answer to that would be that I've looked to employ people who are better than me, especially in the payroll field. Yes, I can run a payroll. Yes, I can do payrolls. But, you know, if you were to ask me today, what's the, uh, the employer's national insurance rates or what, what is the LEL kind of band or anything? <laughs> I don't know, but I know a man who does. I know sure. a person who does. But I completely agree, Stuart. I think um, those that build great teams around them and mm. are willing to take people on in roles that are better than yourself, and I've got this in a presentation I'm due to deliver tomorrow, funnily enough, <laughs> um, is absolutely at the core of, of a successful business. Fantastic response. Excellent. So the experiences you've gained in building and selling companies, you must be in constant demand, which is shown by the fact you've obviously recently become an executive director at the CIPP. What typical help and advice do you then provide? Going to a business sale is not something that many payroll people will necessarily have exposure to. Is there any practical advice you can offer listeners 
now that they could take away from this podcast and perhaps implement immediately or at least consider for long-term future aspirations? I think there's, there's two parts of that answer, that question. The, the first one really is when a company is looking to be sold, which doesn't really have any effect on the payroll side of things. Sure. I often get business owners that will say to me, how do I value the company? I'm turning over £1 million. So does that mean the company's worth a million or is it worth £3 million? Yeah. Uh, my immediate answer to them is, it's not so much about the revenue, it's about the profits. Sure. Somebody's going to come along, it doesn't matter whether you've got £1 million turnover, if your profits are zero, they're not going to make any money by buying your company. It's the revenue for vanity, profit for sanity. Correct. That's, yeah. Absolutely. So that's, that's the first thing. I think in terms of a bureau, my experience there is that the buyers have been looking for, A, who the client base is, as well as the profit line. The two go hand in hand. If you've got a really good, healthy client base with some well-known names in there, boy, that does help a lot. But also, are they profitable? Fantastic. Now, I'm really excited to get into some detail about your latest venture, which we're going to get to just after we find out a little bit more about you. Time to find out more about you. How would your friends describe you, Stuart? How would your work colleagues describe you? I think my friends would describe me as a a very likeable chap. At least I like to hope so. (laughs) I have lots of friends. As far as my work colleagues, I think they would like to say that I'm very fair. You know, for example, if somebody had made a mistake and let's say a Bax transmission had been missed or whatever, I would say to people, don't put it under the carpet, just come to me. Let's look at it. Let's understand what's gone wrong. But the most important thing is let's look at how we can put something in order to make sure it doesn't happen again. And so I think if I treated everybody fairly in that way, then I would like to feel that that's how they would describe me. Excellent. We're all humans. We all make mistakes. Yes. As long as it's not done out of vindictiveness, I fully and wholeheartedly agree. So tell me something about you that perhaps other people won't know about you. Yeah. In my retirement, I started learning calligraphy. Okay. That's something I definitely didn't know. That's really been very therapeutic. Okay. How's it going? Uh, Slowly. (laughs) (laughs) I did uh, write a very, very nice inscription in front of a book for my grandson for Christmas last year and put from his granddad and his nana, but then realised I misspelt nana. Excellent. Fantastic. And the calligraphy, you've got to get it right. And I, I should add, you are married to an English teacher? I am, which is even worse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you are abducted by aliens who want to learn more about our species. What item would you take with you? I think I might know the answer to this, but I'm going to let you answer in case I'm wrong. I'm going to bring in my trombone. Yes, that's what yeah. I thought you might say. I'd have to show them that you know the trombone is the majestic instrument of the orchestra. For those that aren't aware, why the trombone? Tell, tell us a little bit about your, uh, your very impressive trombone background. Okay, well, you asked me earlier about, you know, I've been in payroll. Well, prior to that, I did nine years in the band of the Burundi Guards. So, yes, I was one of those guys with the funny hats on, doing the changing the guard and the trooping the colour. And one could say that I joined the army to see the world, and I certainly did. But it did mean that by the time I'd finished my military career, yeah, I could probably uh, shoot somebody at three yards with a trombone, but I had no idea what to do with a rifle. Do you have played at the Royal Albert Hall and some really uh, interesting locations? Yes, I do, yeah. I, I play in the International Staff Band of the Salvation Army, so that's their premier band, and uh, which means that I play in a concert once a year at the Albert Hall. Last weekend I was at the Birmingham Symphony Hall doing a concert. We've done three recordings this year. Next year I've seen the itinerary that we're going to America for five days and we're off to Norway for a long weekend. Amazing. So, yeah, I do get around playing my trombone. Yeah, it's, my, it's my job to bring that out. It's, <laughs> it's good information. I don't think we need to answer the next question unless you want to answer it. I was going to say, what game or instrument do you teach them? Would that be the same answer? Oh, I would have to teach them trombone. Absolutely, of absolutely. What would you tell them about humans? I would tell aliens that we are a very complex but lovable race. Fantastic. And what truth or human trait then would you hold back from telling? I think that women actually are better things than men. <laughs> so we're going to go back to the questions. Five technical questions. What I'd like to tell the listeners about is your latest payroll business enterprise. Now, it is an API payroll software company called Payrun. You can check it out at payrun.io. I think before I ask you to tell the listeners about the software itself, I wonder if you could just explain what API is. It's relatively, I say it's relatively new in terms of technology, but not everyone is familiar with API technology. So do you mind just educating our listeners a little bit on 
what API is to begin with, and then perhaps we can go into your, your new venture. So if you can just tell us a little bit more about API and what that is, that would be fantastic. Yeah, so API stands for Application Programming Interface. It's a way that computer software can talk to each other. So a quick example would be that we went onto the internet and we looked at Expedia and you said you wanted to go from London Heathrow to New York, uh, what day you want to go, and you just press the search button. Expedia, through using API, look at all of the airlines, checking their databases, looking through the API, pull back the information and display the results on the screen. All Expedia is doing is through the the links of the advanced programming interface or APIs is bringing that information from all these other websites and bringing it to me. Now, how will that affect payroll? Well, really, uh, there are one or two bits of payroll software available on the market today who offer limited, but some kind of API. So it does mean that once you run your payroll, if you wanted to link your payroll into an accounting solution, say for example, there may be some API opportunities. And when I sold the last business, I sat at home for a few months doing nothing. But actually, I did my garden, and I enjoyed doing (laughs) that. But I realized that there was a frustration still in my mind that the payroll industry here in the UK was still relying on old technology. You know, you only have to look at, uh, say, for example, cloud technology. It took the payroll industry in the UK a long time to catch up with cloud technology and software as a service. And... Really, there's not a lot that have got the API. In fact, some payroll software will have the API, but they don't allow it out to the, the general public. So I got together with a couple of colleagues, and we decided, actually, in some ways, we just had to be a bit fun to actually build a payroll software that was just API. Yeah. Now, that does have its restrictions, but the only restrictions are that if I'm sitting with somebody and saying, yep, yeah, we've got an API payroll software, and they say, show me, well, I can't, because the API is the engine. There's no user screens or, or user interface, UI, as, as also commonly known. I can't really show them, but what I can do is show them the engine. And what that does mean is that if I'm talking to, a, say, for example, a payroll manager, well, the payroll manager is likened to, like, say, somebody who's going to buy a car. That They'll be looking at the outside of the car and looking inside and seeing what the seats are like, etc. But because we're the engine, we're not going to be excitable unless it's the engineer that opens up the bonnet and looks at the engine. That's the exciting bit that's for us. Now, what it does mean is that now that we've launched our company and we've launched payron.io, we're getting lots and lots of people signing up who are already developers or in the developing arena, companies that have already out in the market, they may already have a software solution. For example, it could be a timesheet solution, it could be a HR solution where they would love to have payroll as part of their portfolio. And for example, a HR solution where they may want to have payroll, but they don't want to develop it themselves and don't want to get into the the headache of having to maintain it. So the opportunity they've got now is taking our API, they can build that into their own solution. We've also got a number of corporate companies that we're talking to at the moment, relying on large systems, like for example, SAP, and obviously the costs that are included within that as well. By looking at our API, they just had to bring on board a developer that has the skills of building screens. He's built the screens, put all the boxes on the screen of what he wants, and then links those fields to the API code in our payroll. And uh, off, you go. off it goes. So using your car analogy, it's a little bit like, if I get this correct, for those that are still trying to get their heads around what this API piece means, I have a great Volkswagen Wagen engine. But um, Volkswagen engines are in Audis, they're in Volkswagens, they're in those are different cars. And actually, it's the outside, but you can bespoke to the user based on what they need. And you can make it look as pretty as you like, but the engine is the same in each product. So if I want a a really good payroll engine, but actually on top of that, I want a timesheet solution developed, and I want reporting developed, and I want one client may want, I don't know, manual payslips, one might want Mm. e-payslips, I can almost pick and choose Correct. The bits that I need, I just have to get them individually developed to fit my engine. You don't then have to buy a payroll that's got everything in it. Sure. You're only just having the payroll built to what you, you're on requirement. So you're only so paying for the bits that you need. You're only paying for the bits you need. That's that's another good a good thing for that as well. So I was quite fortunate. I met with the one of your head developers, Tim, mm-hmm. uh, I believe is uh, one of the owners Correct. inside yourself. I met him uh, about a month ago now in Devon. He lives down the road from me, funny enough. And a really exciting conversation. I think this is, for me, in my understanding of speaking to power managers every day who use a variety and a wealth of different systems, it's quite revolutionary. It is. 
And I think really it's an accumulation of all those years of experience in payroll. All that experience that I've gained in the payroll industry is all now accumulating into this software. And even to the point that using today's technology, for example, we ran a 10,000-man payroll the other day, and it took less than five minutes. Wow. Wow. That might scare some people too, though. Uh, It might well do, yeah. But it does mean that if you've done the payroll and then you need to redo the payroll again, it's only another five minutes. Sure. I think that links in closely with hot topic right now of RPA, or robotic Mm. process automation. And we were talking again over lunch where we talked about actually the opportunities RPA offers, offers rather than the the limitations of it or the worry that it may affect jobs, actually it's going to give access to much better reporting and analytics for payroll people to use. So how do you see the role then of the payroll professional changing with systems like your API software coming in, with the increase or influx of RPA solutions coming to the market? How do you see the role of the payroll manager perhaps changing over the, the next few years? Oh, it's a very good question. And I think really payroll is going to change in the fact that it's going to become more of a professional occupation. Sure. I think especially with artificial intelligence, I would have loved to have had a bit of software that could not only analyse what the payroll has done for this pay period, but it analysed against previous pay periods in numerous ways. I've seen the bits where it looks at the net pay this month and last month yeah. and the month before, and it gives you a comparison. But sometimes that's just not enough. And what I recognised in, if you like, the human payroll manager – was the ability for some of the ladies that I uh, employed where they could just look at a pay slip or a bunch of pay slips and just pick one out and go, this is not quite right here. That's the bit that excites me about the future. How can I get that intelligence that those payroll people had into a, a computer? That doesn't mean that the payroll people become redundant. Sure. But it means that payroll people can be even smarter and even better at their roles. And their role changes. And we were talking, and you, you mentioned, you know, when this software gets implemented and utilised more effectively – Actually, they can go to HR directors or chairman or CEO mm. and say, look, this is the absence reporting we had yeah. last year. This is how it compares to this year. You can use those metrics or those analytics to really drive decisions and changes to analyze business success and performance. So yeah. the role isn't being made redundant. It's just changing. I, I, I totally agree. And I think really another thing for payroll people is if they took this thought yeah. process, if we were back in the day when everything was done by writing out a check. Yeah. The financial director, the biggest check that he would have to write at the end of each month would be the salaries for the employees. The next biggest check he has to write out is to the earned revenue. Sure. And yet, if that's the biggest outgoing cost for the company, why is there not much information or not enough information provided to the financial directors or the senior manager? So when they get into a board meeting, they're going to be sitting there going, yeah, okay, do we, do we get this coffee machine or that coffee machine? Do we invest in this area or in that area? And yet the biggest outgoing cost is the payroll. I've seen examples where there is not enough information going to the board of where the costs really are sure. uh, increasing in the company. Well, no, it's critical. And they can really bring payroll, raise the profile of payroll if they use that information Correct. in a more sensible or mm. more intelligent way. I mean, you see it from the other side. So what mm. kind of areas are being developed or are you seeing being developed? What are developers doing with it at the moment that you're seeing? The good news about the API software that we have is that it's not necessarily modular-based. It's all been, we've got a tick in the box from HMRC that it's accredited and it yeah. does everything that's required on that side. The one thing that we don't have in there at the moment is CIS calculation. Okay. So I guess that's the next thing that we'll be looking at to see, you know, how and when we can put that in. But someone can develop. Absolutely. It's just a case of when the needs must. At the sure. moment, we don't have anybody asking for it. But the next stage for us really is that we've built the product. It's there. We're spending a lot of time now working with the developers who are building the screens yeah. to help them because... This is completely new. Nobody's ever done it before. So if this is the first time that they're writing an API for a payroll, that's exciting for them, but sure. also we can help them as well. And you can white label it as well. So if you're a young Stuart Hall looking to launch oh. your own consultancy or your own payroll bureau, actually, this is a really interesting software because you can white label it Nick Day payroll software. Absolutely. And, and I think really going back to when I ran payroll bureau, this was one of the main factors that I really hit a wall against. And that is that if I'd had this opportunity when I was running my own payroll bureau, this would have been a godsend to me because the ability to build to my own specifications what I wanted and what I would need to run the bureau would have been fantastic. Quick example, when we ran the payroll, because it was not our payroll software, what we wanted to be able to do is link that direct to the back solution. Yeah. 
so that we didn't have to take information out of payroll, whether it be a file or press a button and run something, and then go to the back solution and then press another button and suck the information in. Why couldn't the two systems just talk to each other? With this API, it can. That would have saved me good quality time, but also it would have meant I could put good quality people onto more meaningful tasks rather than mundane admin tasks. Goes in that. Now, there's one question I'm keen to ask you. I'll be interested to get your takes. I'm going to challenge you a little bit here, Stuart. Okay, go. The payrun.io software, you say, is able to put the power, and these are your words, power of payroll and auto-enrollment into one application. Yeah. And that's quite groundbreaking. Mm-hmm. So I think this is quite interesting because I know that you wrote an article a couple of years ago, admittedly, it was 2016, and the article was about whether or not pensions and payroll departments are ever likely to merge. Now, in that article, your general consensus was that While there is a need for these two departments to work more closely, you didn't think it was ever likely to happen. Now, with your software being able to have the power of payroll and auto enrollment in one application, with the implementation of auto enrollment even, and the advances in technology such as your new payroll solution, do you still have the same view? Well, you know, doesn't that just show how market trends can change? (laughs) I remember writing the article and I remember thinking to myself, there was a time when payroll and HR were two complete separate entities. Yeah. And yet nowadays you can go to some companies and payroll is part of HR or the HR department run the payroll. Yeah. Or even the payroll person has to do some HR as well. Some people are payroll and HR managers. Or the HR. Yeah. yeah. So in a way, I've seen those two departments merge in some way in some companies. And I guess that's where I was thinking about pensions. Sure. Uh, pension departments, pensions were completely different to payroll. But with auto-enrollment, I guess I was putting my my tongue in my cheek and saying, hmm, I wonder if, uh, I think back then, I didn't think it was ever likely to happen. But you're quite right. You know, technology's moved on with our solution. There's the opportunity of the auto, auto-enrollment and everything all now being in one application. So maybe we will start the trend that pensions and payroll and HR and anything else we can think of will all come under one title. So if I had to challenge you and force you for an answer, three years from now, maybe five years, do you ever see the departments merging or do you still think they'll, stay, they'll be separate? I think there will still be some separation, but I think it will be they will be working closer together. Okay, great. So what's the aim then now of payroll? Why should payroll managers consider it if they already have a solution that's working for them? I understand if you're looking for a new solution, mm-hmm. of course, you're going to go to market, you're going to consider everything out there. But if I've already got a solution that's working for me, um, why would I even consider going to an API solution? I think really that the first thing would be because of the flexibility. You know, If you're using a software where you can't make any changes to it, that's it. You get what, what it says on the tin and, and what's on the screen. And you only have to wait once a year for any updates that come from the software provider. But not only that, you then have to rely on the fact that the updates that are going to come are going to work. And it's going to provide you with something that's better than what you already had. Sure. So with this API, with the right team behind you, you could be making changes on a weekly or a monthly basis. You could be providing better facilities to your employees. To go full circle from the start of the podcast, every month you can look at how you can improve your existing process. You're not beholden to the expensive potential developer costs of the supplier you're using. Um, And you can also, I'm assuming here, if you don't have your own in-house developers, you could go to market and recruit a developer, come to JGA, find a developer. Well, exactly. And hence the reason why we had lunch. Yes. Um, Because obviously what we now want to do on our website is to have some partner pages. So that anybody that's looking at that and says, just really great, but I'm a bit like Stuart Hall. I don't understand the development side, but I know exactly what I want. So they could look in there and see if there's a few developers or maybe a developer that's close to where they live that they can get in contact with. That's uh, been done by so many other software providers in the past. So sure. It's nothing new. Yeah, that's, that's an avenue that we're going to kind of look at improving. Excellent. Fantastic. We're getting near the end of the, uh, these questions, Stuart, but ultimately it's clear and really clear to everyone on short listing. You've got a really broad range of skills and experiences across payroll, sales. We've mentioned accounting, a trombone playing as well, oh, software cool. operations. What has been your approach and how would you sum up your own skills and your, in terms of your own areas of specialization? You've got to sum yourself up now into a, a dating style <laughs> yes. quick overview. Okay, cool. right. Well, let me tell you what I used to do when I used to interview people. As you're in the recruitment agency, you'll probably realize this is better than I can. 
when I used to look at somebody's CV, I always used to look to the back and see what their personal interests were. Okay. And if I saw somebody said, oh, I like reading and going watching films, when they came in for, uh, for an interview, I never asked them any questions about the rest of the CV. I used to leave other people to do that. I would come in and say, tell me what's the last book that you read? And then I'd ask them, did they like it? They did not like it. Why did they like it? What did they think about what was said in Chapter 3? Making it sound like I understand what was in Chapter 3, but it was to find out, do they really like reading? The CVs that I really did like, though, was where, for example, there was one person came for an interview, and it said he was the UK junior karate champion. Now, it was, I didn't like it because he was karate, but I knew that if he was the junior UK champion, he was put hours of commitment, commitment into getting to that. So I know that for my trombone, I started at the age of seven playing my trombone. It wasn't until I was about 14 that I took it seriously. But at 14, I decided I wanted to play and be one of the best. To do that meant that I had to come home from school and spend an hour every night practicing my trombone. I joined various different music groups to increase my musical ability. I would always look to see on the CV, what does this person do in their private life? Because if their areas of specialization, they had the commitment to do something like that, I would always believe sure. that they would have the commitment in my business to do it as well. And that's where I do. So even now at the age of 60 or thereabouts, <laughs> uh, still playing my trombone at a high level, I have to practice even harder now at this age than I did when I was younger. Just in the same way as if I was an athlete, maybe my best years or my best uh, times would have gone sure. by now, but I would still be wanting to improve each day. So my, my approach is working on my skills and my specialization is actually making sure that I just tackle it each day, one day at a time, just improving. Always on, improving. Always improving. That's definitely been a theme running through this podcast. Interestingly, Two things I'm going to mention tonight. Number one is, and you won't like this, and um, we take out the personal interests when we send CVs. Well, there you go. Because it can, people can discriminate based on interest. Yes. And actually, our job as a recruiter is to find who can actually do the job. Obviously, there's a personality fit and a culture fit we have to assess as well. Yes. But we do that assessment, so we have to hope that they can't understand that we've already done that assessment, and we are only submitting them on the basis that they already fit in with the culture. But we actually take the interest out of the CV so that they can't have that discriminate view on maybe not liking an activity. We have had some interesting ones. We've had activities such as one guy wrote down that they collected sick bags off planes. We had one guy that enjoyed painting dragons, assuming these are China dragons rather than real ones. Uh, we've had a whole range of different hobbies, and we just thought, you know, we'll take them out. So that's one thing, right, yeah. rightly or wrongly, that we don't personally keep that, that section in the CV when we send it across. But also we've got another podcast, uh, for those listening, coming out soon with a guy called Sean Wilde, who is CEO of a company called Think Learning. So you were talking about the athletic piece. Well, he's a, an international level OCR athlete, obstacle course racing athlete. And it's so clear through the podcast, the whole thing runs through of his commitment to everything, not just his work, mm. but he's a CEO now, also from the forces funding enough, similar kind of route to market. A reason I mention it is it's the common traits of successful entrepreneurs, I guess. He's always looking to improve, always yeah. training, always committed. And I think um, mm. that comes through in abundance with yourself. I think, you know, really within the peril industry, that is something that, I would always encourage, you know, don't, don't just sit back and think, well, you know, I've, I've reached wherever I can reach. You know, if you've not done the CIP diploma course, then go and do it. Sure. Now, if you haven't done the degree course, go and do the degree course. I must admit, I encouraged all my staff to take the diploma. I remember. And one day I was sitting at home, and as you've already mentioned, my wife is an English teacher at a grammar school. She turned around at me and said, do you know, you make your staff do it, but you don't do it yourself. So that was it. I had no choice. I went and did the diploma. After doing the diploma with the CIPP, I enjoyed it so much. I signed up to my local university and did a similar diploma in business management. I enjoyed that so much. I then went on to do a master's at the same university, always trying to improve, always looking at ways that you can – there's always something new out there. Sure. Just go out there and, and do it. And it's much easier to look at someone else and say, well, they'll do it if I don't. Or, no. you know, I watched About a Zoo. It's a movie this weekend with my family. And I only mentioned this, but the simple point was there's a, there's a big – a common thing at the end that says, for 20 seconds, you know, embarrass yourself for 20 seconds. That's all it is, and the great things will happen. And in this particular example, it was asking you to go out for a date. Yeah. But if you have something that you really want to get off your chest or you really want to challenge – 20 seconds, go speak to your boss, go to your HR director, go to your payroll manager, say, I want to do this. You know, this is what I want to do. I can see something change and you never know what could happen. So last question. Okay. Before we go into the vault, 
How do you see the payroll industry changing over the next two to five years? I think the payroll industry over the next two to five years, I see it changing significantly. We know that we've got things like Brexit going on, and whether that's going to have an effect on payroll, I'm not really too sure. But what I do see is that uh, more and more onus is going to be put on payroll departments. We only have to look at all the changes that have been brought in recently, uh, like the RTI, like the auto enrolment. I don't see that stopping there. The government is going to be introducing a lot more. I don't know what they're going to introduce, but I, I just have this feeling they're going to introduce a lot more over the next you know, three to five years. And a, a lot of that will fall at the desk of the payroll person. I've got something for you here. Emma. It might well work very well for your software. There's something that I think is quite interesting that not many people are talking about. I read a really good article by Anna Letting. Blockchain and cryptocurrency payrolls. Yeah. And if you are with a solution at the moment and this breaks as quickly as it is at the moment, then you're going to need your existing software to adjust very, very quickly. Who knows what the future holds? That's where you need an API payroll software. For five years from now, we could be paying people in crypto. So we're going to open the vault. Entering the vault. One piece of advice you would give to someone working in payroll right now. Always look at ways of improving what you're doing. Fantastic. With the benefit of hindsight, what would be the one career decision you would change? Uh, that's a really difficult one because, you know, when uh, I was in the military, I saw myself having a military career and playing my trombone uh, in the military right up until my retirement. Benefit of hindsight, I think the one career ch- decision I would change would be I would have started off my own businesses earlier. Everyone that's had their own business always seems to come back to that as well. Yeah. And I, I would do exactly the same, yeah. by the way, 100%. If you had the power of foresight, it could change the entire payroll industry with one action or improvement. What would that action or improvement be? To get somebody in the government to work with us. Great. That resonates well with the last podcast with Kate Carter. I think yeah. we wholeheartedly agree. Well, I have actually, I should mention it, um, reached out to the HMRC to be part of this podcast. And at the moment, it's falling on deaf ears. So here's your shout out. Come and, come and have your say on the pod. Who motivates you and why? The person who motivated me is Nelson Mandela. And I think the reason for that is that I had the opportunity some years back to go to Robben Island, just off uh, Cape Town, where he was imprisoned for quite a while. I was so moved by the visit of that, of that jail that I came back and I read his autobiography. I would recommend to anybody, it's a big book, but I'd recommend to anybody, read the autobiography. Because if there was anybody who could have come out of prison and being so bitter against his captors, and yet he was the complete opposite. And, and I, I find that very moving, and I, I just feel if I could have some of the personalities and some of the character that he obviously displayed in his, in, in his years, especially his latter years, then I, I would be very happy. Fantastic. Well, I was fortunate enough to go to Open Island this year. Um, I haven't read his autobiography, but I'll go and do that now, but I, I can certainly understand why, why he found it so moving. Incredible. Um, strength of character. If you didn't work in payroll, I might know the answer to this already with your trombone career here, but let's have a look. If you didn't work in payroll, Stuart, what would you be doing? Uh, I think you kind of alluded to it. Yeah, I think I would probably be doing my trombone. Or I also play string bass. So okay. I, I might be playing in an orchestra. Musical. Doing something musical, I guess. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, that wraps us up for today, Stuart. So I want to say a huge thank you for joining me on the podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I think if anyone is interested in finding out more about Pay One, the, please do go to payone.io. There's uh, wealth information there. So I'd just like to say a huge thank you, Stuart, for joining me. And I will look forward to speaking to you all again next week. You've been listening to the Payroll Podcast with Nick Day of JGA Recruitment, specialist payroll recruiters. If you would like to feature on a future podcast, please contact us. For a wealth of world-class payroll content, please visit us at jgarecruitment.com. See you next week.